Hola, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a la segunda sesión de este evento del Grupo de Usuarios en Latinoamérica. Eh, tengo el placer de presentar ahora a un speaker muy especial. Él nos acompaña desde el Reino Unido, Chris Saxon de Oracle. Eh, de ahora en adelante la, la conferencia va a ser en inglés. Si ustedes tienen alguna pregunta, nos encantaría que la hagan en el chat para Chris. Si la quieren hacer en español, la podemos traducir. Al final de la presentación de Chris, vamos a estar abriendo este espacio para que les pueda responder todas sus inquietudes. También les recordamos que en la página del de evento van a encontrar el link para todas las sesiones que van a pasar hoy y mañana eh, hasta las 5 de la tarde, hora menos 6. Los invitamos entonces a que disfruten de este gran contenido que Chris ha preparado para nosotros. Chris, welcome. welcome. It's a pleasure to have you in this Latin American event. We are very, very happy to have you this, this afternoon for you and this morning for us here in Latin America. So welcome and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos dias. Um, guys, it's good to see you all. I say see you all. I can't see you. You can see me. Um, maybe that will change sometime soon. We'll see. Um, and what we'll start do is start off with is answer a question or a problem that you might have been posed with as you're developing applications. So you've been asked to write a query to find the f first three hires in each department. For, so per department, find the first three people who are hired in each. Now, this isn't a basic top end query where you just want the first three uh, of any employees. You want per department. So there's no native syntax to do this in SQL. So we've got to go through a multi-stage process. There's various ways to do this. Uh, one way is first, we can assign a row number in a subquery. So for each department, we're going to have a ascending number, one, two, three, four, five, sorted by hire date. So we do that in a inner query. And then we filter that row number in an outer query. So that gives us the first three people hired in each department. So as I say, this is the kind of query that you might have been asked to write at some point. Or maybe not this, you've been asked to do something subtly different, but very similar. Get the last three orders for each customer. So show the three most recent orders for each person. And if we look at the query we just wrote here, all we really need to do is change the table and column names in the in these sections. The rest of it is basically the same. So we want the same department, the same. Uh, we want to change the department to customer, hire date to order date, that kind of thing. So we just need to switch those columns over. The rest of the query, the structure of the query, basically stays the same, other than the table and the column names that we're using. So at this point, after playing around with it, some wise people might go, well, actually, we've got two queries which are very, very similar, um, but only change in which uh, columns and tables we're accessing. Can we make this query reusable, that kind of template of the top n per group? Uh, and can we apply that, like make a function to do this? And sadly, this kind of strikes at the heart of a common criticism of SQL, as it kind of lacks this generic kind of compo composability. So your answer here is probably like a kind of sad, you know, well, no, I can't really, right? I mean, you know, and it's it's a problem with SQL, as I say. Now, one pe thing a lot of people think we can try and do after learning about bind variables is do something like this. We can have some kind of placeholder the table and column names, which seems like a sensible idea, right? Sadly, you cannot bind identifiers, so table names, column names, that kind of thing in SQL queries. So we can't do this. So we can't kind of make this reusable template for this query, right? Well, I mean, again, it's not strictly true. We could do something like this, open a ref cursor, and then concatenate in the table and column names which kind of works, but is not perfect. You know, we're opening a ref cursor, we're not ha which isn't quite the same as running a query. And we are having to ca concatenate in using string concatenation to build up our SQL statement. As soon as you do that, you accept user input, make it part of your SQL statement, you're at risk of SQL injection. So, yeah, I mean, yes, we can do this, but it's problematic and there's all sorts of issues with it. So. Traditionally, SQL has lacked this kind of generic composability where we can have these query templates or functions that we can pass tables and columns to at runtime to 
change the behavior. That is until now with the advent of SQL macros. And with these, we can define these reusable fragments, you know, have query templates and pass tables and columns to them as functions. So we'll see how we can do that in this session. So hi everyone, I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Gerald Benzel's developer advocate team. It's my job to help you get the best out of Oracle database and hopefully have some fun whilst doing so. So with that in mind, hopefully we'll have some fun looking at how SQL macros work. So we, before we kind of dive into the details of them, first a little overview on what macros actually are. So the first thing to note is that SQL macros come in two flavors, table and scalar. So table macros, kind of the name implies, replace a real table. So they go in the from clause of your SQL statement. Scalar macros, um, you can use pretty much anywhere else that you can use a PL SQL function. So in the select clause, the where clause, the order by, and so on and so, so forth. So pretty much anywhere else, it's legal to use a PL SQL function. So that's kind of like the big high level difference. There's one other kind of minor difference it's important to be aware of at the moment. Originally, SQL macros were slated to be a 21C feature only. However, table macros have been backported to 19C. So if you're on 19, you've got table macros now, scalar macros, you'll still have to upgrade. Do you know, if you're using autonomous, that's kind of off on its own little version train doing its own thing. Um, so if you're on the 19C of Oracle Autonomous database, you do actually have the full feature set here. You have table and scalar macros. So, um, but for other editions of Oracle database, you need to be on 21C to have the full hit. I'm gonna talk about both of these today and show how we can use them. So we've got these two types, table and scalar. How do we actually write one? Well, it's a bit like creating a PL SQL function. All we need to do is add this SQL macro clause saying whether it's table or scalar. Now you can omit this and by default, it is a table macro. So the thing to note here is what we are returning is text, we're returning a string. And that text, the database will take it and make it part of the final SQL statement. So it will resolve that to become one statement at the end. One other kind of minor thing to be aware of at the moment is that SQL macros are implicitly deterministic. So given the same inputs, the string it returns will always be the same or must always be the same. Um, you cannot add that deterministic keyword. If you try and put that in, you'll get an error, but by definition, they should must be deterministic. If they're not, you can run into all sorts of problems. You know, a bit like if you declare a PL SQL function as deterministic and it's not, of course, problem, same with SQL macros. So that's kind of the overview. We're defining a function that returns a string. Let's look at how we would write a table macro. And what we can use is use these in a from clause to change the shape of the result set based on the input parameters. Now, rather than top in per group function I saw, sure, showed at the start, I'll start with something a little bit simpler, just a generic get n rows from any table. So we can do that in SQL this fetch first clause. So we added this in 12C, fetch first, however many rows you want from a particular table. So we're gonna make this a macro so we can generically, dynamically pass the table name and how many rows we want. So we're gonna return text, so we need to quote it, turn it into a string, and then create our macro, which accepts our table and our number of rows. So it's a varchar2 returning a string. So what actually happens here when we call it? Well, at parse time, database does a find, essentially does a find and replace of those parameter placeholders in the string and does an exact textual replacement of the values you passed for those. So it doesn't evaluate them, it just takes those and makes them part of the SQL statement. This is where I think it really helps to look at lots of examples of how this actually works in practice. So, um, Let's say I want to get the top three employees per department. So I call my macro with like this, the HR employees table with three um, for each. The final SQL statement that gets run is from the employees table, get three rows only. We've taken that table name, replaced it for tab, and it's taken three and replaced it for num rows. So, so far, so far, fairly straightforward. What happens if we put a bind variable instead? So we pass in the orders table and the bind variable for how many rows we want to fetch. 
Well, the database doesn't peek at the bind variable and extract its value out and use that in the statement. No, the bind variable itself becomes part of the final SQL statement. So we have a statement, the final statement that's actually executed looks like something like this. From the orders table, we get that bind variable rows only. So that's bind variables, they become part of it. Same applies if we've got a function. Let's imagine I've written some get n function, which returns how many rows we want. Again, the database doesn't execute the function, get that value and make that part of the statement. The function name itself becomes part of the final SQL statement that's actually executed. So we end up with a statement a little bit like this. So that's a kind of very simple, slightly contrived example, you know, um, just get any n rows from a table. Let's build a macro to um, do that top n per group function, you know, the first three um, employees per department, that kind of thing. So we'll create our function with top n per group, and we pass in the table, the grouping, ordering calls, and how many rows we want, and we're going to return a SQL macro. So now I've got my template statement, which looks a lot like the SQL statement we had earlier on, right? Got a row number and we're filtering in the outer query. So we've got our table and a number of rows and you'll notice that I've at qualified the grouping columns. So why is that? Well, the database will automatically substitute in the table name and scalar parameters. So numbers, dates, strings, that kind of things. But it will not do that with the columns. So it won't automatically substitute in the column names. So at this point, I think it's good to take a brief look at the two, two new types of parameters that exist with SQL macros. Now, they're not entirely new. If you use polymorphic table functions at all, they actually were first introduced there, but we've reused them for this. They're probably new to a lot of you. So we've got our, there's this DBMS TF package, and there's a table type parameter and a columns type. And the table type, as the name implies, apply, represents the name of a table or a view, or it could be a common table expression with clause, um, subquery factoring, whatever you want to call it. And the columns um, type is it uses the column pseudo operator, which is a comma separated list of the names of the columns that you want to provide. Now, key thing to note here is the table type is exactly one thing. The columns type is a list of things. So the table type, because we've got a one-to-one -one mapping, the database will do that replacement. But there isn't a native way in SQL to take a list of values and just implicitly convert that into text, right? So it does not do that substitution for you for those columns. We have to do that replacement. There is another tiny little difference, which for most practical purposes doesn't really matter, but might be worth knowing, is that the table type does actually have to refer to a real physical table or a, a view or a um, with clause named subquery, right? If you point to something which a non-existent object here for the table type, the macro itself will not execute. The whole function will fail. With the columns type, you can supply a big long list of column names and some of those cannot exist, right? You can pass in fake column names which aren't real in your query or in your database anywhere. And as long as you don't use them in your macro, then everything will work. Now this is, you know, a subtle difference because in most cases you probably will use them all, but it can, uh, there are some scenarios um, where that might be useful. Uh, so again, it's a subtle point, but worth knowing. The key thing here is it's substituted in the table names, but not the column names. What we need to do is iterate through those to build up our string of column names. So we can do something like this. We'll loop through them and build up a list of the grouping columns, the partition by columns, and the columns we're gonna sort by, the ones that are gonna appear in the order by, and then we can replace our at placeholders in the string with that. Um, and then we'll just finally return that string. So having done that, we can then get our top three em employees per department by running this, right? Nice and simple, not much more straightforward than that SQL query. So we can standardize this and then give it to, you know, front end developers, people less experienced with SQL and say, just call this function and it does what you need to do. You don't need to know what all that SQL is underlying it. And the uh, and best thing is we can now pass in any table and columns we want to do. So we get the top three, the first three um, 
orders per customer. Um, if you remember at the start, I said the last three orders per customer. If we want to uh, change the sorting, we'll need to add a flag in. Um, I've got a little demo at the end. We'll show that in a bit more detail. But the key thing here is we've got our function now, and we can pass in any columns and tables that we want to it. So we've got our generically reusable function. It's pretty neat, right? I, th I, I think this is really cool and really useful. So at this point, you know, some of you are thinking, OK, that's neat. But um, one of the reasons I said the original approach, where we had a ref cursor and we were concatenating in the table and column names, is one of the reasons we wouldn't do that is SQL injection. You might go, well, what about SQL macros and SQL injection? How are they safe? Well, first thing is, as I said, the database does some detection to make sure it's not, I say it's a find and replace, it's a bit more advanced than that. You know, it's checking that it is in fact a valid table that you are passing to it. So we're limited in what we can actually pass here. The other thing to note is if you pass in text parameters, so varchar2 values or char or clob or that kind of thing, uh, you cannot inspect their values within the macro. So here, I'm concatenating in that dodgy string, which someone's going to use to do some like all one equals one or union all or some other nonsense to try and inject code in here. They cannot do that because its value is always null. Any of those character parameters, you just can't see what was actually passed there. They are nulled. We want to use the value of that dodgy string. We just place it within the string that we are returning for the macro. And then the database will replace it by quoting it as a literal. Okay, So it doesn't become part of the SQL statement. You just get back the stuff you passed in, which is you know one equals one, union all, whatever it is you're trying to do to try and hack something in. So it's not part of the final SQL statement. So it is, it's not impossible, but it is very, very hard to write vulnerable macros okay um it is possible i'm not going to tell you how because you know uh, something to figure out on your own if you want to but it is very difficult and certainly by default you're unlikely to write vulnerable ones but the key thing to note here is this is a literal so we've looked at table macros and as we said we showed i showed you could use it to do like a top end per group and there are a lot of other kind of fairly common um business problems that crop up, uh, at least in my experience, where there's kind of a template query you'd like to be able to pass in different columns or tables to at runtime. For example, finding consecutive rows. How many consecutive days did we have you know, sales on the website? How many consecutive days did we have full availability on the website? That kind of thing. Very common problem. Um, various ways to solve it. We can now create our macro and just have our consecutive rows function, pass what we want to it. Another common problem, turning CSV values, so a string, the comma separated values, split that into rows. Um, it's a bit messy <laughs> to do that in Oracle database. You've got to do all sorts of string manipulation. We can create a function to do that. And also, um, very common problem is date generation. You know, Give me a row for each day between these values, that kind of thing. So we can create table macros to do this. Um, maybe in your application, there's more specific ones, and of course, there might be might have um, common joins that you want through your application. So you can create a macro which does all those joins for you, and you can call that rather than everyone having to remember it. So table macros are great for these kind of query templates, and it's an entire SQL statement essentially. Let's now move on to scalar macros and look at a different problem. So as we live in kind of a global world, if you're out in South America somewhere and you've got customers over here in Europe, um, then good chance that you've got some currency conversions in your processes. You might issue your invoices in euros but need to convert them to, you know, Mexican pesetas or Brazilian, is it rails? You know, your local currency. So increasingly in this global environment, currency conversions are a thing when you have to calculate the value. So when you're doing that for your invoices, you'll have to do a calculation like this. So typically, we store the units, uh, unit price and how many you bought as separate columns. So you multiply them up and divide by the exchange rate to get the title values in your target currency. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, there is a potential lot of complication that goes on here. First up, 
what rounding rules do you use? Most currencies have two decimal places for their minor unit. Not all of them do. Some have no minor unit. Some have three decimal places. So you need to factor that in. It's also worth bearing in mind that some companies um, don't want to do a straightforward round where if it, you, know, you go up or down to the nearest integer. They like to take the ceiling or the floor, whichever works in the company's advantage. So they gain like half a cent, up to half a cent on each transaction. You know, it's a small amount, each customer is not going to notice, but multiply it up across millions of transactions and you made yourself several thousand just by changing your rounding rules, right? So you want to be able to do that. So there's some complexity here. And the other question here is something I always need to think about very carefully when doing exchange rate conversions is, are you multiplying or are you dividing to do the conversion, right? It depends on which, how you've represented the exchange rate. So um, there's a lot of complexity here, and this is financial information, which is kind of thing that you want to be sure is handled in the same and standard way, right? You want everyone to do this currency conversion the same way. You're likely to do this a lot of times throughout your application. So again, some wise person on your team will probably say something like, well, we should make that a function, right? We've got some generic functionality we're going to use a lot, and we want to be sure it's right. Let's create a function, we can test it, make sure we have it the same everywhere. Okay, so let's do that. Let's create our PLC equal function. We'll just run the fun um, formula we've got, and we'll put that in our SQL statement. All good, right? Job done. Well, that is until we come to actually execute the SQL statement, and suddenly it is significantly slower. Yeah, bum, right? Um, so why is this? Well, the SQL and PL SQL um, languages have different runtime engines. So if you've got a SQL statement that calls a PL SQL function, has to swap over to the PL SQL engine, execute it, and pass back again. If we're processing lots of data, we could have to do this lots of times. And while each individual switch is fast, do anything lots of times, and it will slow things down. So this is kind of a bit of a problem, right? We've got this dilemma. Do we go for maintainability? Make sure we have that well-tested function, use it everywhere, accept the performance hit, or do we go for outright performance? Just code it, everything in pure SQL, but accept that we're going to have to do more testing and there's a higher chance of bugs and that kind of thing. There isn't a straightforward answer to this, and you probably have to make some exceptions um, from time to time, whichever way you lean on this. Now, note, there are some existing solutions. There are some ways around this existing. For example, we could create a function-based index, which helps to some degree, um, but there are some problems. First up, the query has to actually, the index has to be relevant for the query. We're selecting a small enough fraction of the rows. If you're processing most of the data in the table, you're going to do a full table scan, and the index doesn't help us here. Right? The other thing to, important thing to be aware of is that these functions must be deterministic. Right? If we've got non-deterministic functions, we can't use them in a function-based index, or you can, but strange things will happen and you'll get weird and unexpected results. Right? So this can help, but only in a limited set of scenarios. Another thing you could do is in 12C, we added this um, new pragma, user-defined function, UDF, which um, lowered the cost of that context switch, so made it a bit faster. Didn't eliminate it entirely, it's still there, but it did make it a little bit quicker. Um, so we can use these and they can help in some scenarios, but not all. And whatever we do, the chances are, you know, the query's still gonna be a bit slower. So we're still left with that dilemma. Do you go for, you know, maintainability and reusability, or do you go for outright performance? As I said, there isn't an easy answer to this question. Scalar mac macros offer us a way out of this problem, right? Um, so how do these help, or how do we write them and how do they help? Well, we write a scalar macro basically the same way we write a table macro. The only difference is put SQL macro and you mark it as scalar. So you say it as a scalar and we return that expression, that formula. So now having changed the um, function to a macro where we run it call it in our SQL statement, as I said, the database resolves this at parse time. 
So at runtime, it's like the function doesn't exist. We are executing pure SQL at runtime. This means two important things. Mostly, most notably, is there is no context switch at runtime because that function is resolved. It's gone. It's we are down to pure SQL at runtime. We don't have that context switch backwards and forwards between SQL and PL SQL. This alone will, in many cases, give you the performance gains that you need. There is another advantage, which is a bit more subtle and won't always help, but important to be aware of. And that is that PL SQL functions are essentially a black box to the optimizer. It doesn't really know, at least by default, what's going on in there which makes it harder for it to find the right plan for a particular query. By, resolve, by making it macro and resolving it at parse time, it has full visibility of the underlying expression, which makes it more likely that it can find better execution plans. You know, it's not guaranteed, it won't help in all cases, but it makes it more likely you'll find a better plan. So, well, ch better chance of better, faster plans and no context switch. So, We've got the performance of pure SQL with the maintainability of pure SQL. Sounds like a winner, right? Sounds perfect. So at this point, some of you might be wondering, well, why don't I just make all my existing pure SQL functions and turn them into SQL macros? Maybe even further, why don't we just make this the default, right? Why, why do we have these two different types of things? Um, why, so, you know, why don't we just do this conversion for you? Well, there are a couple of important differences between SQL macros and PL SQL functions. One of them's a bit of a technicality, um, but important to be aware of, and the other one just kind of you know, blows the whole thing up water in terms of making them equivalent. But in any case, they add up to mean that they are, in fact, they do have different behavior. So to see the first one, the kind of mm, technicality, which hopefully won't affect you, but will in some cases. Let's create a function, and it's just a wrapper for coalesce. So we're returning the first not null argument. So coalesce will return the first of these arguments, which is non-null. Now, if we call this as a pure PL SQL function, and we pass in something that's going to throw an error, like 1 divided by 0, PL SQL uses application order for evaluating the arguments. So it evaluates the arguments and then runs the function. So we've got in here one divided by zero. What's going to happen? We're going to get a divide by zero error, right? Because it executes those and then executes the function. SQL macros behave slightly differently. So let's make this a macro. We'll just kind of stringify everything. Now, if we call this, it uses normal order for processing this. This means it push, essentially pushes the functions inside, or the arguments inside the function. So it now does coalesce one or one divided by zero. Coalesce uses short circuiting. So this means that it um, stops processing on the first non-null argument. One is not null. So it never processes one divided by zero and we get a result. Ugh, ugh, interesting, okay. So slightly different behavior here. As I said, hopefully this won't affect you too much or in too many scenarios, but it is important to be aware of particularly if you're passing functions as arguments to functions, you could end up with different behavior here in some scenarios. So subtle thing, but important to be aware of, important difference why we can't just swap them all out. But as I said, there is a much, much bigger reason why we can't just turn all your existing um, PL SQL functions into SQL macros. And that's what happens if you call a SQL macro in PL SQL. Well, as, I have said, as the name implies, SQL macros, this resolution only happens in SQL. If you call a SQL macro in PL SQL, you just get the text of the expression back. You just get the data, the um, text back itself, right? You don't, it doesn't resolve it into its components and um, evaluate that, okay? So we can't just swap them all out. If you've got PL SQL functions, you call in SQL and PL SQL, then you know, you've still got a bit of thinking here to do, a bit of dilemma. You know, Do we um, main two copies of it, have the PL SQL version and the SQL macro? Do we have the SQL macro and make a PL SQL wrapper for it? You know, still a bit of decisions and thinking you've got to do there. But certainly, if you've got PL SQL functions, you 
only call in SQL. You can make the macros and get the, you know, say the maintainability benefits of PL SQL with the performance of PL SQL. So, uh, so this is, uh, I, I think this is great, and hopefully you think, well, this is pretty neat. Think of things you can do with this yourself too. Um, one question you might still be wondering at this point is, well, how do we actually debug this? How do we know what's going on here? Well, there's a function which we added back in 12C sometime, I believe, and it's expand SQL text. So what we can do is pass this, for example, a view, and it will return you the underlying SQL in the view. We can use this to see what's going on inside a macro. So you can pass it a table macro, and you'll it'll expand it out to the full underlying SQL statement that's executed. I said table macro for a reason. It only expands table macros. If you've got scalar macros, you'll still just see that function. So you won't see the fully resolved version of that in your statement. So um, at this point, I've talked quite a bit about how that works. I think it's always nice to see try how these things actually work in practice. So let's just run a little demo. So we'll start off with the, um, uh, the the problem we started with, you know, get the first three people hires in each department. So we've got our row number function, and we're filtering in, filtering that in our outer query. So you know, it's it's all right, but as I said, it's you know, somewhere between intermediate and advanced SQL, and this might be a problem you come into regularly. So it would be nice to create a function to do this for us. So let's create our macro, our top end per group. So we're going to pass in our table, our partitioning or grouping columns, our sorting columns, how many rows. And I've also got a parameter here to say whether or not we're going to sort ascending or descending for those columns. So we've, because the columns are a list of values, as I said, we'll have to build them up into a string. So we iterate through them. If it's part of the descending columns, we'll change the sort on it from ascending to descending. And then we'll concatenate those into the final SQL statement. So let's just create that function. Yep, that created that. So now we can call it with the employees, department, hire date, and three. So this is now identical to the query I ran at the start here. So this um, macro here is giving us the same as this statement at the top. We've created our nice, simple wrapper for it. We can pass um, any table to. So going a bit too far. Um, as I say, we can now we can pass in a bind variable as well. So I'm going to pass in. I think this is a bit tiny for you to see this. But I'll pass in one. They'll get one employee department. We we'll see all those row numbers are one. Let's increase it up to five. So we get up to five people de department. There isn't five in every department, but hopefully you can see those row numbers are getting higher. And that's because that bind variable is part of the final SQL statement. So we can have a function. Uh, just a demo just to show what's going on here. So we'll always get five. So we'll return five, call that function there, and that will give us the first five orders or the last five orders for each customer. So we can see that. So as I said, this table parameter could be a real table, could be a view, can also be a named subquery, so the with clause. So you can see I passed in rows here. So I can do some pre-processing of it, count how many orders each customer is placing in each store so that we can find who are the best customers in each location, who buys the most. So we run that and we'll find the um, two customers who make the most purchases at each location. So we can do that, so we can pass in a subquery to this as well. So it's pretty neat, right? Um, and as I said, let's move on and look at SQL injection. So I've got the, my example here. And classically, with dynamic SQL, if I did something like this, where I'm catenating this in, accepting user input, this was a massive risk that someone could do something dodgy. So I'll call inject me. Um, so someone could try and do something like this to union all the information so we can see everything from all the user objects and that kind of thing. So let's see what actually happens when we run this as a macro. Well, we've got an error. And why? as you hopefully can see there, is the actual statement that's getting executed here is this. It's just set select blank, select null, because that value is null. Um, and of course, this is a junk statement at this point, right? Because it doesn't mean anything. Um, so we're selecting null, and there is no column C in the dual table. 
Um, if I try, uh, if I change it so that dodgy string is actually part, part of the macro you return, this literal gets replaced. So we will just get back that actual value here. So you can see I've just selected in the um, nonsense that I passed in. So as I said, it is very hard. You have to go out of your way to write vulnerable macros. Um, so they are much safer than dynamic SQL is classically. All right, show you the example, a uh, slight different difference between classic PL SQL and scalar macros. So we've got our coalesce function, and this is a PL SQL function. This one divided by zero will get evaluated first, and the whole thing falls over. We've got an error, so that doesn't work. Change it to a macro, on the other hand, do the same call, and it is evaluated does not error, because essentially we're doing coalesce one and one divided by zero. So subtle difference in behavior here. Be careful if you've got functions that you pass um, as arguments to other functions which have side effects and so on. You need, you, and you want to change those functions to macros. So just be aware and watch out for that. Of course, but as I say, the biggest reason why you're not just going to change all your existing um, functions to macros is call it in PLC call and we just get the text back, right? It hasn't done the substitution with the values one and zero. Okay, all right. So um, as I said, you've still got some thinking and a dilemma to do. If you've got a PL SQL function, you use both in SQL and PL SQL. Um, just to move on and kind of show in terms of performance gains you can get from this though, let's have our pure PL SQL function, a traditional PL SQL function, and then let's have a macro version of it as well. Um, and I'm going to do this for our order items table. So it's just under 4,000 rows. I'll call it 1,000 times. So we're going to execute this um, 4 million times, essentially. So essentially, when we've got our PL SQL version, we're going to have pretty close to 4 million context switches or somewhere in that region. With the SQL macro, as I said, the database is going to resolve that into pure SQL, so there are no runtime context switches, and we will see that gives a massive performance benefit. You know, if we've got our PL SQL function in SQL, we've gone from 10 seconds turning it into macro, one one and a bit seconds, so an order of magnitude um, performance benefits here. So, if you want that reusable maintainability of these functions that you're going to use throughout your fun um, system you can define them as macros and still use them in SQL and get the performance of pure SQL. So you kind of almost have your cake and eat it as well. Um, it is worth noting, however, if for whatever reason you've got the data and you can stick in pure PL SQL, you don't need to run a SQL statement at all, pure PL SQL is still faster than running SQL at all, right? So if you can avoid, if you've got some code, you've got the data, you've cached it or whatever, and you don't need to run SQL at all, sticking in pure PL SQL is significantly faster still. So as I say, some thinking, some dilemmas to do. Okay, we're near the, we're near the end. Um, I'm just gonna show you quickly uh, how we debug it in some of the examples. So let's take my macro here, top end per group, and I'm passing in a function and I've got the uh, scalar macro as well. So it looks fairly s simple here we can see what the database resolves that into. So you can see, if I just format that as well. Yeah, okay, there's quite a bit going on here, but you can see there's our row number function and it's there's our product and quantity columns we passed in. If we go back up, product and quantity, and we've got our get n function, um, so that get n hasn't extracted its value out. No, the function itself is part of the SQL statement, okay? But unfortunately, we can't actually see what's going on inside the scalar macro. So particularly if something complicated is happening, um, you still debugging and that could be tricky. But with table macros, you can pass this to expand SQL text to find out what's actually going on. All right, uh, let's just, so very quickly, I will show you some examples and then we'll wrap up and got a moment or two for some questions. So as I said, CSV to rows, um, we have to do this, well, various ways to do this. One way is this kind of slightly complicated uh, text in CSV to rows. Let's just change that. So we want to split this out into three rows like that. It's a bit of a faff to write this query, right? 
So we can make it into a macro, and now we can just call that like this. Much easier, much more straightforward. Um, and this allows us to do like a variable in list. So we can pass that as a bind variable, and we can find all the people in that CSV list. It's pretty neat. I think this is pretty cool. Um, you could also join to it. You know, this is a table now, so we can join to that as well as use it as in a subquery like this. Um, as I said, finding consecutive rows, we can do. I'm, I'm not going to go this, but just point. This is a kind of complicated SQL, right? We can find consecutive rows. We can make it a macro, and now all we have to do is that called get consecutive rows much easier to do these kinds of things and uh, got date generation macro as well past start and end dates um, so we've got date for each a row for each day in October um, I also have to change the unit so every seven days one week so each week in 2021 all right so that's what I want to show you um, I'll just wrap up and then we can have some questions all right so just to recap so say SQL macros they return it an expression, a, a SQL template, essentially. And there are two types, table and scalar. Table macros replace a real physical table um, or view. You'd use them in the from clause. Scalar macros replace PL SQL functions. So the select clause, where clause, that kind of thing. The way the database resolves them is it's, it's, it's an advanced find and replace of the text that you're passing. These are incredibly safe from SQL injection, certainly compared to earlier internal uh, alternatives, but this replacement only happens for table um, parameters and you know scalar values, number, date, string, that kind of thing. Column names that list the columns, you still got to do the replacement yourself. Finally, this is a pass time resolution, which means at runtime, you're down to pure SQL. So you can get avoid context switches um, and help the optimizer find better plans. So we've got that maintainability of pure uh, of PL SQL performance of pure SQL. The next time, if someone comes, you've written some crazy complicated SQL statement that's pages and pages long, um, and someone came to you and says, well, can we make that reusable so we can pass in different tables and columns to it? The answer now is, oh, yes, we can with SQL macros. All right, if you want to know a bit more about this, um, you know, if you want to try things out, really recommend our free tier, which gives you access to up to two Oracle Autonomous databases where you can fiddle around with this. Um, if I've got blog posts where I go into lots of details of the top end group, the group problem and show how that works and break that down in the macro. And on Live SQL, we've got a tutorial showing you how that works. Um, if you've got questions, um, let me know. I'll see if there's. Um, I'll say I haven't loaded the scripts from this into Live SQL yet, because it's still on 19C, not on 21C. When Live SQL is upgraded, I'm not sure when that will be, um, then I will load the scripts from this in to that as well, so you can fiddle around and see how that works. All right. Um, was there any comments or questions that we needed to address? Um, No tiene alguna pregunta adicional para Chris? Pueden escribirla si quieren en español en el chat. I was going to say, I see there is one question. Could all functions rewritten to yeah. SQL macros in order to get this benefit? Um, I mean, in theory, yes. As I said, there are some subtle differences in how they behave. So depending on how you're using them currently, then um, you you m might need to be aware of that. So that will depend on use case and what you're doing. It's the kind of thing that in theory you shouldn't do and shouldn't be a problem in practice can be an actual issue. So that was like, you know, we saw one divided by zero as a peel SQL function calls an error, turn it to a SQL macro and it executes. You'll need to check and test for that. But yes, in theory, you could change them all um, or your existing functions to SQL macros unless you want to use them in SQL. SQL and PL SQL, in which case you'll need to maintain two copies somehow or other, right? So still need to think about that a bit. Um, was there any other comments or questions? <laughs>
Uh, maybe business logic could be complicated to rewrite this functions. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not sure if you're, that's a question or a statement, but yeah, if you've got complicated, it's the classic thing with SQL. You've got a complicated where clause or something like that. Um, and you've, you're going to use it in two or three different queries. Well, what do you do? Do you like you know, copy that logic and risk it making mistakes in the um, process? Or do you make a function for it and accept things could be a lot slower? You know, SQL macros off use that alternative where you go, yeah, we can um, create that function, get get the performance. So you've got complicated business logic. And as, as with table macros, let's just say you've got, I don't know, four or five tables in your application, which are almost always joined together. You know, you want to pull together customer and all their order information, for example. You could create your macro get customer orders which does all those joins and then people just need to call that function and use that so you can use it to wrap joins and things like that as well so okay. they, they were asking about if we are going to share your presentation I was telling that uh, some of the presentations will be available through social media with the organizers of the event. So you, you have to, to be following the, the social media of the Latin American Oracle Users Group community. So Chris, I, it seems like there, there are no more questions. Is there any final comment that you would like to share with the audience? I just think um, all I'd like to say is uh, I hope you enjoyed this. More importantly, I hope you learned something, and and maybe we'll all be out of our houses and actually able to visit each other in person sometime soon. So um, goodbye and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, Chris. Have an, a great night. And gracias a todos por acompañarnos en esta sesión. Recuerden que el día de hoy solo está empezando. Ya tenemos más de 16 sesiones en lo que queda del día. Si todavía no se ha inscrito, no tiene el link de acceso, puede entrar a la página de eh, laowc.org para así registrarse y ver todo el calendario, los speakers y los contenidos de las charlas que, que vienen. De parte del grupo de usuarios de Oracle en Latinoamérica, y de nuevo a COM les damos las gracias por acompañarnos y les invitamos a que sigan en redes sociales y sigan posteando todo lo que están aprendiendo en esta sesión. Thank you, Chris. Have a great night and see you next year here in Latin America. <laughs> All right. Cheerio then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.